get, obviously get too bogged down in the details of this uh, for our <laughs> audience today. But the, uh, yeah, it's hard to, to get into details, but I, I have always been fascinated by quantum physics, by the fact that nature at the microscopic scale of atoms and photons obeys to laws which are very different from the laws we are used to. The, the logic at, in the microscopic world is very different. So as physicists, we are working all the time with atoms and with, with light, but usually we work with huge amounts of atoms. A piece of mat material uh, contains billions and billions of atoms, and, uh, and a beam of light contains billions and billions of photons. And when you have a lot of particles, uh, the logic of quantum physics is, so to speak, veiled. You don't see directly these laws at hand. So my, my dream has been for a very long time to be able to isolate a single atom or even more difficult, a single photon and be able to manipulate this single object. Just first of all to understand better what was going on at this scale and, and maybe one day uh, to be able to use this strange logic for possible applications. It has been said in the previous, I, I came at the end of the previous session and one of the members of the panel said that quantum physics has been at, at the, the origin of all the modern technology we have in this world. So really to understand how uh, nature behaves at the quantum level is essential not only for our understanding of the universe and of nature, but also for potential applications. And so at the very, very basic levels of nature, things operate on a quantum level. However, all the technology we use, while it exploits that behavior, we still see it and measure it and manipulate it at a classical level. What you were doing was at the boundary between those two worlds to a huge extent. Excuse me? What so what you, the work you were yes. doing was at the very boundary yes. between quantum and classical. Level. Yes. We, we work with single particles and then we see the quantum laws, so to speak, naked. And then when we build systems which contain more and more particles, we see how this quantum behavior washes out, so to speak, and how we uh, recover the classical appearance of the world, which is the usual world we have around us. So this transition between the quantum and the classical is called decoherence, and we try to understand it, first of all, just to understand, but also maybe to be able to prevent decoherence and to bring the quantum laws at a larger and larger scale, so for possible applications. In some ways you could say that what you were working with and the construction that you built, I mean you were building curved mirrors, yeah. tiny yes. curved that would, that would contain a single photon, was yes. it? Thing yes. it and would keep the single photon yes. rebounding sufficiently long yes. for you to be able to measure it. Yes, we built traps for photons and we observed these photons in the box. The photon is a very uh, uh, important and strange particle. You have, it's the most uh, you have billions and billions of photons around in the universe. This is the most popular particle, so to speak. And at the same time, the photon in, in free space is eternal. You have photons which come from the end of the universe and which have traveled for billions of years. But if you try to keep the photon in a box, you have to put mirrors around, and it's a very fragile particle. So you cannot keep it in, so to speak, in, uh, in a kind of uh, artificial surrounding. They, they disappear very quickly and it's very important to have very, very good cavities if you want to do these experiments. Other people are doing the same with atoms. My colleague Dave Wynand, who shares a prize with me, is trapping single atoms and using light to probe the atoms. We do the opposite. We trap single photons and we, we use beam of atoms crossing this box to understand the properties of, of the photons. So, on, in, in fact, the, most, the, the basic phenomenon is the interaction of atoms with light. Most of the information you get from the universe comes from the light which atoms in stars or in, in the outside space emit and the light that we receive give us all the information we have about the outside world. So to understand the basic phenomenon, how a single atom emits a single photon and what you can do with this elementary interaction is really uh, essential if you really want to have a deep understanding of the quantum laws. Is there a sense in which this small photo, this photon that you have, this trapped photon you have, uh, was the equivalent of Schrodinger's cat to a certain extent? If you yeah. could have opened yeah. the box, uh, we're all presumably familiar with Schrodinger's cat and the idea that the cat is either dead or not yes. dead until you make the measurement. Yes. Were yeah. you keeping the cat in both states? Yes, in fact what we, 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 we trap in this box a handful of photons and then we can, so to speak, tailor the state of this photon ensemble in various shapes, so to speak, and we can prepare the system in, at the same time in two different 
uh, state, which is the equivalent of this metaphor that Schrodinger developed about a cat, which would be at the same time dead and alive. So the physicists, by just uh, kind of joke, uh, have defined all this kind of physics as raising and taming Schrodinger's cat in, in the laboratory. Of course, these are not big system as big as a cat, but they are systems which contain already a few particles and you can try to do interesting things with that. It's difficult to think of a field which is more abstract or more blue sky uh, or required a longer, more, to a sense, a romantic view of devoting your life to find the solutions to these problems. Yeah, it's blue sky in the sense that we don't do that because we have in mind an application. We do that because there is a challenge there. Can you do that? Can you observe a, a photon without destroying it? Uh, usually when you observe light, every time you observe light, you destroy it. The light is striking your eye and it's transformed into a kind of electrical signal and the photon is, is dead. Now what we do is quite different. We, we trap the photons alive. So there was a challenge at the beginning and what was motivating us was the challenge and the possibility of doing things which had never been done before. And uh, but there is no doubt that someday there will be some application, as it has been the case in the past with the laser, with the transistor, with all these uh, fantastic uh, blue sky advances of the last century. Okay, now we're going to move, because obviously at the stage of, of having been rewarded, rewarded for your work in terms of Nobel Prizes, by the way, the, the work that they were rewarding, was that uh, across your entire career? Was there a particular moment that, the thing that, that they were rewarding? How, how far back uh, was the actual work that you were given the award for in 2012? Uh, it was work which had been done between 1996 and 2006. So it's about a 10-year right. period uh, which occurred about 10 years ago. But I must say that the, uh, it was a result of a very long-term research which I started at the end of the 70s and which I've been able to carry on with uh, colleagues which have stayed with me all the time. So what I want to emphasize is that the teamwork, the, the rule of this prize is that you just pick up someone and he gets uh, the credit for the general public. But, uh, but basically, uh, I, I think that my colleagues, the people who work in the field, know that this is the work of a team and they recognize the other people of the team as well. Okay. Well, I'll go from your work and we'll return to yeah. many of the topics raised within that. But we're going to introduce a panel because they work in different fields and they work at different levels within the ranks.